So just as uh, Jason read for us, we are going to be in the book of Luke today, Luke chapter 14. So if you haven't turned there yet, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 14. And this verse is, is likely going to be very familiar to all of us, but nonetheless, it, it does require a constant reminder for all of us as we go about our Christian walk. And I, I ran across a poll that I read this week um, this poll was conducted in March of this year, so just a couple of months ago. And this poll is um, its very relevant to what Jesus is going to teach us today. So I want to share to you just very, real briefly of what this poll taught. This poll concluded that um, 70% of Americans claim to be a Christian. 70%, that's about 200 million Americans. Perhaps the biggest indictment, though, came when it showed that of these 70% of people that claim to be a Christian, 60% of those people said in the very next sentence that Christianity was somewhat important or not very important to them in their life. Now, we can see here there's a vast, almost a systemic problem that we have here, is particularly in America, with how we view our Christian life. And it's obvious but by these poll numbers that a, a large majority of the population that professes faith in Jesus Christ by this poll would certainly lack the commitment to Jesus Christ. You see, anybody can say here in this poll that they're a Christian. In fact, about 120 million Americans here say that they're Christian in one breath, but in the very next breath, they confess that Christ really isn't all that important to me. And presumably these people say that they're a Christian because they go to a Christian church. They show up on Sundays. They own a Bible. They go to a Bible study. Or maybe out here it's because we live in the Bible belt. But they're Christians by profession only. And they will claim that Christ doesn't really mean much to them. Now, this problem that we have here with the lack of loyalty, the, the lack of commitment to Christ, certainly it's not a modern problem here. This isn't something unique to us because this problem is actually disseminated all the way from back in the first century. The, the problem that we have today with people profess, professing faith in Christ without the commitment to Christ is exactly what Christ contended with all throughout his earthly ministry. This is what he battled, amongst many things. But this is something he battled. People that would profess to follow him, people that would profess to have faith in him, but have no commitment to him. And in this section of Luke here, this is exactly what Jesus is going to address. Remember last week, Abraham preached a very profound message that rest is found when you come to Christ Jesus here is going to teach us exactly what it means to come to Christ. What does it mean to come to Christ? Now, there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to before we get to the text, because it's going to kind of set the tone here for what Jesus is teaching. In just these couple of verses here, Jesus is going to mention the word disciple three times. Remember, anytime you're studying the Bible and you see repeating words or repeating patterns, there's emphasis there. It's emphatic. The author is trying to draw your attention to something. So just in these couple of verses, Jesus is going to mention the word disciple three times. Now that word disciple in the Greek is the word mathetes. It, it means to follow, right? It, it, means to, um, it means to learn from. And that word mathetes, it means uh, one who accompanies someone in order to be just like them. That's what that word means here. Another important point we want to kind of look at, when you look at verse 26 and 27 and 33, that word disciple is there, but Jesus is always going to put before it a personal possessive pronoun. You see, he's not talking about being a disciple here. He's not talking about being a random disciple because every time he uses mathe taste, what does he always precede it with? My disciple. This is not a random disciple. He is talking about the personal possessive disciple, one who belongs specifically to him. Now, one more point. 
you're going to notice here that again in verses 26, 27, and 33, Jesus is going to put this entire message in the negative. Because in 26, 27, and 33, he says, you cannot be my disciple. He said it three times. He's drawing an emphasis here. And he does this on purpose. Jesus puts this message in the negative on purpose because he wants to arrest your attention. He's trying to arrest the attention of those who were in the crowd that day. He wants to seize their hearts and their minds. That's why he puts it in the negative. And he wants to do this to ensure that there is not a single person in the crowd, you, that doesn't understand exactly what he requires to be a disciple. He wants to make it clear. If you want to learn from him, if you want to follow him, and if you want to make claim to being a Christian, here's what he requires. I want to show you something. Keep your finger here. Uh, Go with me to the book of Acts real quick. Just two books later. Go with me to the book of Acts real quick. Go to Acts 11. I I want to show you something here. And this is going to be the crux of Jesus' message. Acts 11, verse 26. It's, It's talking about Paul and Barnabas here. Acts 11, 26. It says this. And when he, Barnabas, he was looking for Paul. And when he had found Paul, he brought him to Antioch. For an entire year, they met with the church and taught a considerable number of people. And the disciples were first called what in Antioch? Christians. You see, what are the disciples called? Christians. So Christians are disciples. Disciples are Christians. And what Jesus is doing here is he intends to shock you with understanding the extreme demands that he requires to be called a Christian. He's doing this to provoke you and your heart, and your mind, and all those in the crowd to exactly what it means to lay claim to being a Christian. So, to the 70% of adults in America that profess to be a Christian, and I would assume everybody in here, including myself, is part of that 70%, the question you're going to have to ask yourself is, does the profession of your faith, does it conform to what you're about to hear? Does your Christian faith look just like this? Because if it doesn't, what does Jesus say three times? You can't be a disciple. And what is a disciple called? A Christian. You cannot be a Christian if it doesn't look just like this. So let's go back to Luke 14. Let me set the scene here for you. Go back to Luke 14. Let me set the scene here. So Jesus is getting ready. um, He's kind of approaching the very end of his earthly ministry. He's getting ready to be crucified. And he's um, getting ready to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And at this point, he's been in his ministry here for several years. He's um, been preaching in Galilee and Samaria and all throughout Israel. And he's been performing all the miracles, right? He's been raising people from the dead. He's been healing the sick. And in all this time and all these signs and wonders that he's been performing, Jesus has amassed a huge gathering, a huge crowd of people. Now in this crowd here, it's a mixed bag. There's some that are following Christ for genuine reasons. But by far and away, there are many that are not following him for genuine reasons. They just want to be part of the miracles. They just want to see something cool. So what he's going to do here is Jesus is going to address these followers. And by extension, he's going to address all of us. You want to follow me? I'm about to go to the cross and die for those who would follow me. Let me tell you what it means to follow me. Or just as Abraham taught last week, let me tell you what it means to come to me to find that rest. Let's start in verse 25, Luke 14, 25. It says, now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, make note here, the word crowd, it's in the plural. It doesn't say a large crowd, it says multiple large crowd. And by some estimations, they say this is in the tens of thousands of people at this point. And what's also important to note here 
is the verb here, going along. It's important to understand the way this verb is used because it's going to set, again, the scene and the tone for why Jesus is about to say what he's going to say. That verb here, going along, sum pariuomai in the Greek, what it means, it means one who travels with. That preposition there, sum, means to be with. It means one who is accompanying. But what's important to know about this verb here is it implies a certain degree of flippancy. It implies a certain degree of detachment or frivolity, levity, if you will. It means one who's just going along with the crowd. It means one who is simply um, going along for the ride. They're being uh, tossed by the waves and the current here. There's frivolity here. They really don't have much investment here. So Jesus is going to turn around and look at these tens of thousands of people who are going along with him, who are along for the ride. Look what he says in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, stop there. So Jesus here is going to open with a general call. He's going to say, if anyone, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your rank in society. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or if you're a Gentile, a man or woman, rich or poor. It doesn't matter because we all must come to Jesus Christ the exact same way. There is no exception here. Everybody must come to Jesus Christ the exact same way. Now, before we get to this next part here, I want to point out two very important verbs, and they're going to govern this entire section. In verse 26, he says, come to me. And in verse 27, he says, come after me. They're the same verb, but they're used slightly different. And these two verbs here, to come to me and to come after me, they always are found together. You do not do these apart. You do not have one without the other. You do not get to come to Christ without coming after Christ. And you cannot come after Christ until you have come to Christ. So these two verbs here are intrinsic to discipleship. These two verbs here are important to being a Christian. So in verse 26, he says, if anyone... It doesn't matter who you are. You come to me the exact same way. If you come to me, here are my terms. Jesus is about to lay out his terms of what it means to be a disciple. But one thing I want to draw your attention to real quick is I want you to see what it doesn't say. Notice here what Jesus' terms aren't. He doesn't say here that if you want to come to me, you have to pray a prayer. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say to me that um, if you want to come to me, you just have to invite me into your heart. He doesn't say that if, if you want to come to me, just, just add me to your life. Just accept me into your life and let me be a part of your life. He doesn't say that here. Rather, what Jesus says here is, is, is far more difficult. It's far more profound. Look at it. Verse 26 If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Now, this is the shock that he wants you to hear. This is the shock that he intended to provoke amongst his audience. This word hate here is provocative, of course. And he is giving you that proverbial punch in the gut here because he wants you to understand right off the bat what the extremity of his requirements are to be a Christian. So the question becomes here is, what is he saying? Because doesn't he tell us in the Decalogue that we are to honor our mother and our father, right? And does he not say in John 13, 34 and 35 that I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you? And by this, the world will know you're my disciple if you love one another, so how is it in John 13, he can say that if you're a disciple, you love. But in John 4, or Luke 14, he says, if you're my disciple, you have to hate. What's he saying here? What we have to understand is, is whenever we see a word, we're always going to study what's called the semantic range. We always want to see not how we use the word, but we want to see how that word was used 
when it was written. We want to see how this word was used in the first century, not how we use here. So let's look at this word here for a second. The word hate in the Greek is a verb. It's the verb maseo. Now it has several meanings and the context will determine what it means. This word maseo, it means to hate. It means to detest. It does mean that. But when you study this word in its context and the way it was used in the lexicons, you'll see that the primary way that this word maseo was used it means to renounce your favor for something. It means to esteem someone or something to a lesser degree. Simply put, it just means to love someone or something less. That's what this word maseo means. So certainly Jesus is not advocating hatred here because that would violate the entire tenor of the scripture. He's using hyperbole here. I think we can all understand that. And what he's doing here, he's speaking to loyalty. He's speaking to devotion and absolute commitment. And he's telling us that in order just to come to him, just to come to him, it's, it's not a prayer that you pray. It's, it's not a mere invitation into your heart. But it's that you love everyone most important in your life to the degree that by comparison, your love and your devotion and your commitment to Christ seems like hate. When you compare the unparalleled commitment and devotion to Christ, everything else would appear as hate. So Jesus is telling his audience and he's telling all of us that just the initial act to come to him, to be a Christian, to profess saving faith, in Jesus Christ is absolutely not just a prayer you pray or an invitation to your heart. Those are all nice sentiments. But Jesus is saying here to come to him is the act of forsaking your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, and your children. And you do all of this to demonstrate your unparalleled devotion and commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, we probably all sit here right now and thinking, well, so far these demands are very benign. These demands here are, are, are largely, to us here sitting, are, are, are largely not a threat. Because look at the culture we live in. We, we live in largely a Christian nation. I use the term loosely. There's not much persecution for us here. If, if one of our friends or family would walk up to us and say that I'm a Christian, we would all celebrate but to a first century Jew whose culture places priority on family and loyalty within that family, this is a big deal. Consider his audience, his original audience. To a first century Jew, to profess undying and unparalleled commitment to Jesus Christ, what would your legalistic Orthodox Jewish family do to someone who's going to abandon their traditions and works-based salvation system? What would that Orthodox and legalistic Jewish family do to a first century Jew that professed love for Jesus Christ? They would reject them. They would persecute them. They would oust them out of their synagogue and they would kick them out into Samaria. They want nothing to do with you. But remember, in the first century, they're poor. They rely on each other. They're all they have. So to tell a first century Jew that you have to profess undying commitment and unparalleled devotion to me, to us it may not mean much. Because we don't have a whole lot to suffer from. We live in a Christian nation. But to a first century Jew, this meant everything. Everyone that you love most, you must be so supremely loyal to me that you are willing to forsake the ones that you love the most just to be my disciple, to be called a Christian. As a matter of fact, what he's saying here is you can't love anybody more than me. How do we know? Go real quick to Matthew, just for a minute. Just for a minute. Keep your finger here. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10. I want to show you something again. Jesus is saying the exact same thing here that he is in Luke. He's just going to put it in the positive. He's saying the exact same thing here in Luke, 
in Matthew, rather, that he is in Luke, but he's just going to put it in the positive. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 37. This is Jesus speaking here. He's saying the same thing. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, Jesus in Matthew's account here, he's saying the same thing he is in Luke, just in the positive. He's saying in Matthew that you just can't love anyone more than me. That's what he says here in Matthew. But in Luke, all he's saying is, is you have to love me so supremely that everything seems as hate. He's saying the exact same thing here. Now, at this point, some of us might be thinking, well, so I have to love Christ more than I love my mom and dad and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. Well, that's really not that difficult because I don't like them much anyway. So you might be thinking this is so far may not be all that difficult because I got an uncle. He's kind of a weird guy. But Jesus is going to cinch another knot on the belt here. He's about to make it even harder to come to him. Look at verse 26. If anyone, doesn't matter who you are, we all come the exact same way. You must hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children's, your children, your brothers, your sisters. And yes, just in case you were wondering, you have to hate even your own life. So not only are we commanded to love Christ eminently and so supremely that it would violate all other love to those who are most important to us. Now he's going to add another layer onto this and we are to hate ourselves. Now this here, this is what's going to hit at the heart of Christianity. This is where it becomes hard. The question is, is why is it hard? Well, when you look at the current modern evangelical message, it teaches you that all you have to do is profess Christ as your savior. It says that, um, if you profess Christ as your savior, that you get to have all the spiritual blessings of Jesus Christ, but you can also live any way you want. You see, the current message teaches us that we get to have Christ as our savior held firmly in this hand, and we get to have the world held firmly in this. All the indulgences, all the sin that we want, any way that we want to live, we get to hold it firmly in this hand. We get to have Christ as our savior held firmly in this hand, and we get all the blessings with it. And we get all the good things that go with it. But I, I don't have to submit my life to him. He says, I get to have all the blessings of Christ, the toning death held in one hand. But no one tells me how to live my life in the other. I get to have him as my savior, but by no means will I submit to him as Lord. No one sits on the throne of my own life, but me. So I get to have Jesus Christ held firmly as my savior in this hand, but I don't have to submit to him as Lord because no one lords over my life but me. That's the current message. Just accept him as your savior. This is hard because it requires us to abandon ourself. So what is Jesus talking about here? When he says that you are to hate your own life, what does that mean? Because remember, 70% of people say, I'm a Christian, he's my savior, but by no means will I ever sub uh, submit to him as Lord. When Jesus says to hate your own life, he's talking about absolute submission to his kingship. Keep that word in mind. Kingship, lordship, same thing. So Jesus here is saying that in order to hate your life, he certainly isn't talking about taking it. Again, he's using hyperbole. We can all understand that. To hate your life in this context, what does that mean? It means to forsake your own will. It means to submit to the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. It means that you no longer sit on the throne of your own life. It means that you humbly submit to his sovereign kingship and rule over your life. It means you abandon all selfish pursuits and you pursue him. You see, to hate your life in this context here, it means that you love Christ so eminently, so supremely, that you will, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
If you love me the way you profess, you will abandon your will and you will follow mine. If you love me the way you claim, the way you pull, you will forsake and abandon yourself and follow me. So Jesus says here, if you love me that way, you will forsake yourself, your own will, your own passions, and you will embrace him as Savior and Lord. You no longer sit on the throne of your life, but in absolute submission to the king. Now, the verb tense here is extraordinarily clear. Make no mistake. It's a present tense verb with a negation here at the very end of verse 26. He says, you cannot be my disciple. This is a present tense verb with, with, with a negation, meaning the way this is constructed in the original language, it's saying you can never be my disciple. If you do not come all the way, you cannot be my disciple. And the way this is constructed, you will never be my disciple. So when you look at this first verb here in verse 26, to come to me requires you come all the way. And he makes it very clear that if you have not come all the way, you're not a disciple. And what is a disciple called? A Christian. If you right now have professed faith in Jesus Christ and you have not come all the way, now is the time to do a serious spiritual inventory on the profession of your faith. Now, at this point, I, I would have to imagine that the hearts and the faces of those in his audience in the first century, I, I'm sure their countenance has fallen. I'm sure their hearts are racing because this is likely something they've heard for the very first time. But Jesus Christ is going to gun the accelerator here. He's going to cinch another notch on this belt here. He's going to make it even harder to come to him. Look at verse 27. It says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Now, we just saw in verse 26 what it means to come to him, right? Coming to him requires you come all the way. Absolute commitment and loyalty to Jesus Christ. Now he's going to give us one more layer onto this demand. Now, he, this is where he says, you have to come after me. We come to him, and now we have to come after him. And it's another present tense verb here. What does present tense mean? It's an ongoing. It's a continual thing. It's not something you've done once or that you've done twice. It's something that you live by. It's a lifestyle. So when you are to come after Christ, present tense, you are to always come after him. You are in a constant pursuit. It is a life committed to coming after Jesus Christ. Not something you do once. It's not something you do on Sunday mornings. It is a constant pursuit of Jesus Christ. So when you have come to Jesus Christ and you have come all the way, it doesn't stop there. Now we come after Jesus Christ because Jesus does not allow passive followers there is no such thing as passivity in Christianity. And he's going to give another universal decree here. In verse 27, he says, whoever. doesn't matter who you are. We all come to Jesus the exact same way, and we all have to come after Jesus the exact same way. Nobody is exempt. Whether Jew or Gentile, man or woman, rich or poor, everybody must come after Jesus Christ the exact same way they come to him. Everybody is expected to do this. Jesus Christ demands active participation from all of you, myself included. He demands active obedience. And if you want to come after him, you also have to, you want to come to him. You also have to come after him. There is no such thing as a passive Christian because a passive Christian is a non-Christian. A passive disciple is a non-disciple because in, uh, Jesus says in John 8, 31, so Jesus says to the Jews who believed in him. So in the book of John, these Jews were professing faith in Christ. And what does Christ say? If you continue 
in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Note the word continue. It's not a one-time thing. Christianity is not a one-time enterprise. It's something you continue in every single day. So for those in the large crowd, and by extension all of us, we have never meant, we have never meant to be um, hidden in the crowd. We've, we've, we've never, uh, were meant to hide our Christianity. We have always meant to be, understand this, we must be in tow with Jesus Christ every single day of our life. We're not 50 feet behind him. We are right here at his side. But Jesus here, he's going to qualify one more time. He's going to give us another qualifier of what it means to follow after him. Look at verse 27 again. Look at the beginning of verse 27. He says very clearly, whoever, the universal call, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me. So in order to come after him, what do we first have to be doing? We've got to be bearing our cross. In order to first come after Jesus Christ, so after you've come all the way to Jesus Christ, the next thing that we have to be doing in order to come after him is we first have to be bearing our cross. But what's important to note here, it's not a cross that you bore once. It's a cross that you're bearing right now as you sit here. Your Christianity isn't measured on something you did 30 years ago. It's not something you did last month. It's what you're doing right now. Because, again, it's another present tense verb here. That word bastadzo in the Greek means to carry. It means to bear up. But it's a continuation verb. It's a continuing verb. It's a progressive verb, meaning it's something you do as a lifestyle. It's something you do on the daily. Why? Because Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, if anyone comes after me, let him deny who? Himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, a cross that you bear is not something you've done once but we should all be bearing it right now. One other kind of an important exegetical consideration here that's important to note. Jesus is going to use a reflexive pronoun here in the original language. He's not telling you to bear a cross. He's telling you to bear your cross. He says you have to bear your own personal cross. He, she, it, and us all have our own personal cross to bear. Every one of us. And there is no exception because it says whoever, all people. This has become very personal. You all, and myself included, have a very personal cross to bear. So the question becomes, again, what does it mean to bear a cross? What does it mean to bear your personal cross? If discipleship requires us to be bearing a cross constantly, what does it mean to bear a cross? And to understand this, I'm going to show you two elements here. Uh, you can't exhaust this, of course, but I'm going to show you two primary elements that it means to bear your cross. So turn with me to Galatians for a minute. Galatians 1. I'm going to show you something here. Um, what it means to bear your cross. This is something we are to do every single day. Galatians chapter 1, we're going to be in verse 3. So Paul is speaking here. In verse 3, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. So, Paul says here that at the cross, in the most selfless act, keep that in mind, in the most selfless act, Jesus Christ humbled who? Himself. And he offered who? Himself. He offered himself up to crucifixion unto death, all to do whose will? It says the God and Father. So Jesus Christ came to do whose will? 
The Father's will. Because doesn't he say in Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done, right? So at the cross, who did Christ deny? Himself. And he did this to do the will of the Father. And in doing the will of the Father, hear this. He died selflessly for us. At the cross, to do the will of the Father, Christ died selflessly for us. And because Christ denied himself at the cross to do the Father's will, we too must pick up our cross, not to do our will, but to do God's will. And just as Christ died a selfless death on the cross for us, we in turn must pick up our cross and die to who? Ourself. And just as Christ offered his life as an offering to God in full commitment and obedience, we too pick up our cross and offer our life as an offering to God in full commitment and obedience. So in this context here, what does it mean to take up your cross? It means that we follow in the footsteps of Christ. We deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow the will of God. It means we pick up our cross, and just as Christ died selflessly for us, we die to self for him. So to pick up your cross, it means we follow the footsteps of Christ. But there's one more element here that I want to show you about picking up your cross. Go with me to Matthew 27. I want to show you one more that's going to be very applicable for us today here. So, so far we know that picking up your cross here, it it means to submit to the will of God at the sacrifice of self. It's exactly what Christ did on the cross. But there's one more element here that I want to show you. In Matthew 27, 27. Matthew 27, 27. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the praetorium, and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And they put a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and they mocked him. And they were saying, Hail the king of the Jews. They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off of him. And they put his own garments back on him. And they led him away to be crucified. And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. So when carrying his own personal cross, Jesus Christ was stripped of everything. And when he carried his cross, they put a thorn on him. And he carried his cross all throughout Jerusalem, the Via Della Rosa. And the cross was a very public display of shame it was a very public display of revilement and rejection and repudiation and jesus carried his cross for all to see across jerusalem and when he carried his cross what did they do they mocked him they spat on him they persecuted him and they beat him unrelentingly you see what did the world not show jesus christ They didn't show him any mercy. They didn't didn't accept him. They rejected him. So be prepared to bear your cross publicly. Just as Christ did for the world to see knowing this. That when you bear your cross publicly. You will be spat on. You will be mocked. You will be beaten. And you will be hated by the world. Just remember. Remember. Your absolute and total commitment to Christ at the expense of being hated by the world. Just remember what you're willing to forsake to be a disciple. Remember what you're willing to endure just for the sake of picking up your cross, walking step for step with Jesus Christ. Because he had his own personal cross to bear and we have our own personal cross to bear. Be prepared to live a crucified life, is what he's saying. So the Lord makes it clear here. 
to the 70% of the people so far and everyone in this crowd that profess to be a Christian, if you want to come to me, if you want to find that rest, the first thing he requires is you come all the way. You have to be willing to forsake everyone and everything in your life, including those who are most important to you, and then you have to pick up your cross. You have to die to self, submit your life to the will of the Father. You have to live your Christian life publicly. You have to carry your cross publicly, knowing that you will be rejected and beat and spat on. You are going to be reviled by the world. Because in in 2 Timothy 3.12, Jesus says, Indeed, all, not some, not a few, but all, all those who desire to live a godly way in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. It doesn't say you might be persecuted. It doesn't say you could be persecuted. You will be persecuted. And by the way, anything less than this, what does he say? You can't be his disciple. Anything less than absolute 100% commitment right now, you cannot be a Christian. You can't. So if you have come to Jesus Christ right now and you haven't counted the cost, you may not be a disciple. So count the cost. That's what Jesus is saying here. Count it. Count it because you cannot get this wrong. You have to count this cost because you can't get this wrong. Don't believe for one second Jesus is saying that your discipleship, that your Christianity is only two hours long on a Sunday. It's it's not an empty profession that you make. So count the cost because if you don't, You cannot be a Christian. You can't be a disciple. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to show us next. Jesus is going to show us here, um, those who claim to be a Christian, those who claim to be a disciple, but have never counted the cost. That's what he's going to talk about here. He's going to talk about those who have never counted the cost. He's going to talk about those who have never done the math on this. Because he's telling you, do the math on this. And he's going to do this here in two short parables. He's, he's going to do um, the first parables in 28 to 30. And the second parable is going to come in verses 31 to 32. Now, for those who have made a snap decision to come to Jesus Christ, for those who think all you have to do is pray a prayer and accept them into your life, um, for those who come here today because their wife told them to, Uh, For for those who um, simply come to Jesus Christ because they don't want to go to hell, this parable is for you. Let's look at verse 28. It says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. So Jesus is going to use a word picture here to kind of illustrate his point. But one thing I really want to point out to you that is vital to understand here. So far, Jesus has addressed everybody in the third person. So in the original language, everything has been so far in the third person, he, she, it, they. Jesus is no longer addressing he, she, it, or they. He's not addressing them. He now shifts to the second person, which means he's addressing you personally. At this moment, right now, as Jesus is teaching this, he is literally looking every single person, including myself and those in his audience in the first century, straight in the eyes. This is exactly what he's doing. He shifts from the third person to the second person. And one thing that's important to know is the honor-shame motif is um, extremely important in the ancient Near East, in ancient Israel. You would never do anything that would ever bring shame among you or your family that is strictly forbidden. And what these people would do, kind of like out here, um, we own a bunch of land. People out there owned a lot of land. They were farmers. There was Agriculture was a really big part of the first century. And what they would do is is they would build these big giant towers. 
so they could go up to it and sort of get a bird's eye view of their property. This is what they did. And just like anything, you'd have to sit down and make sure you have the money, you have the resources and the people to build this endeavor. And if you begin to build it without counting the cost, understanding it, and you couldn't complete it, the community would know what a fool you were for starting to build something so enormous but didn't have what it takes to complete it. They would see, what a fool, why would you start building something, especially something so big, and not have what is required to finish it? If you so flippantly build something, but you lack the commitment to complete it, what good is that? If, if you make a snap decision to build a tower without understanding exactly what it takes to finish it, what good is that tower? Now, this, this illustration probably doesn't hit home for us, because we don't really do that here, but in the first century, the Jew would have known exactly what this means. And Jesus' larger point here is what use is having an unfinished tower in the middle of your field? What eyesore, what does that serve in the middle of your field? It's useless. If you're going to build something so large, what use is laying the foundation for it unless you know exactly what it costs to lay the last brick? That tower is useless. What use is having a half-finished tower in the middle of your field? It serves no purpose. It's useless. So if you make a flippant or snap momentary decision to come to Christ and not understanding the cost... What's going to happen when you face trials and tribulation in that faith? You see, when someone tells you that coming to Christ is easy, that praying a prayer is what gets the job done, or a simple uh, invitation into your heart, what's going to happen to that person the moment trials come? Because um, doesn't James 1, 2 say to count it as joy, not if trials come, but when they come, they're coming. It's not a matter of if trials come, but it's when they come, they're coming. So when you go to this latest revival here, because there's revivals everywhere out here, and the preacher says, um, well, all you guys have to do is add Jesus into your life. What's going to happen in the moment of trial? The pastor told me that I'm already a blessed man. I already have a wife and a home and children and money. All I have to do is add Jesus onto my life and my life is complete. What's going to happen to that person the moment trials come? They're going to say, well, I've never really counted the cost, but I can tell you this. This is not what I signed up for. The person that has never counted the cost, the moment trials come, they're going to say, well, um, I'm not willing to bear this cross. This is far more than what the brochure said. This is far more than the Jesus that was sold to me. This is not the way my pastor said that Jesus required to come to him. This is not what I signed up for. It's too hard. The life that he is expecting his disciples to follow is far beyond what I'm willing to commit to. I still want to sit on the throne of my own life. Turns out this Christianity is not for me, he says. Because he wasn't willing to live a crucified life. This man's profession here, just like the unfinished tower, is absolutely useless. It serves no salvific purpose at all. This man thought Christianity was an easy believism. This man thought that um, Christ, uh, to follow Christ was easy. But then he finds out exactly what it requires, that it strips you of everything, and you are to bear your cross stride for stride with Jesus Christ. And by the way, you are following him stride for stride publicly, knowing that you will be rejected. And the first man in this parable here, the man in this first parable made a snap decision, a superficial decision. And come the moment of testing, it found out, he found out that he hadn't counted the cost. He wasn't willing to fully commit. He laid the foundation. He prayed the prayer. But he wasn't fully committed. Now, the second parable here, it's, it's also, again, it's going to address 
one who has not counted the cost. But it's going to make a little different here. It's going to show you that if you don't follow Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you everything. The first man said, um, I will follow Jesus Christ and I'm going to count the cost and I count it and it costs me everything. The second man in this parable is going to count the cost and not follow Jesus Christ. And it's going to cost him everything. You see, you have to understand when you follow Jesus Christ, what does it cost you? Everything. But if you don't follow Jesus Christ, what does it cost you? Everything. Steve Lawson makes a very good observation. I'm going to borrow his words when he says this. Nobody slides into eternity on easy street. Nobody gets into eternity in a waltz. You see, getting into eternity, you're going to live forever. Are you going to live forever in the presence of Christ or in the absence of Christ? And if you count the cost to follow him, it's going to cost you everything. But if you don't follow him, count the cost because it's going to cost you either way. Look at verse 31. It says, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one going against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now, the first king in this parable here, it's the man who is seated on the throne of his own life. The first king in this parable is the one who says, nobody tells me how I can and cannot live my life. The first king of this is the hero of his own story. He's the king of his own castle here. And the second king in this parable is the king of kings, who is Christ. One thing I want to draw your attention to is notice where these kings meet. They're not meeting for Sunday brunch. Where are they meeting? In battle. That word here in the Greek, polemos, means war. Polemos means armed war in the Greek. The strongest word. So you're not meeting Jesus Christ for brunch. You are meeting him in war. And when you step into into war with the king of kings, you are far outnumbered. So when you understand the the Roman and first century numerical system, the number 10,000 was the highest number they counted to. So to say that you have 20,000 men, that's the same thing as saying you have infinite. In the first century, 10,000 was as high as they went. So to say that you have 20,000 means you have infinite. So this first king in this battle is going to see the king of kings have an infinite army and see that he is far outnumbered. You don't have the power. You don't have the resources or the ability. So before you engage into war with Jesus Christ, the king of kings, consider what it will cost you to enter into this battle knowing you have no chance of winning. You don't have the manpower. You don't have the skills and you don't have the resources to even come close. So to the king that's sitting on the throne of his own life, who will one day stand face to face with Jesus Christ at war on his day of judgment, he must count the cost of going into battle with him, knowing he has absolutely no chance of winning. So this king has two options. To the king that sits on the throne of his own life, who refuses to submit to the kingship and lordship of Christ, he's got two options. He can refuse to submit to the kingship of Christ, and he can uh, live his own life, and he can refuse to deny himself. He can uh, refuse to live a crucified life in absolute loyalty and commitment, and he can take his chances. He can say, I've counted the cost. I'll take my chances. I'll go to war. With this king who has infinite amounts of army. But what would a smart king do? A smart king would say, I have no chance. I have an astronomical amount of of soldiers at my disposal. But this king of kings has infinite. I have no chance. So what, what is the only option for this king that sits on the throne of his own life? Look at verse 32. He says, or else, 
While the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and he asks for terms of peace. So what is this king's only chance? What is his only hope to come to peace with the king of kings? What are these terms of peace? You have to hate your mother. You have to hate your father, your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wife, your children, and even yourself. The terms of peace to be at peace with Jesus Christ, because Paul says in the book of Romans that before our conversion, we were enemies of God. Apart from Christ, we are enemies of God. So what are these terms of peace? In order to be at peace with Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, you must have absolute commitment and loyalty right now. You must pick up your cross and live a crucified life and come after him in the present tense all the time. It is a life committed to the pursuit of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the kicker. Anything short of this, if you come 99% of the way, you have just waged war with Jesus Christ. You cannot come to Jesus Christ part way. You don't get to do 50% now and 50% later. It is 100% commitment and loyalty and devotion to him and him alone right now. He wants you to know that the cost of not committing to him will cost you everything which leads to death. But he also wants you to know that the cost of committing to him will cost you everything which will lead to life. So count the cost, because if you don't count the cost and you do not submit to me completely, you're going to be separated from me in hell. That's the cost of not following him. So count that cost. But he says, if you come to me, count the cost. And what's the cost? He says it one more time in verse 33. You want to follow me? Here's the cost. So then, none of you, universal, nobody is exempt here. Everybody is held to the same standard. None of you can be my disciple. And by the way, that's in the second person, none of you. None of those in his crowd of the first century can be his disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. That verb there, to give up, means to renounce. It doesn't mean to go sell everything and get rid. That's not what that's saying. It's saying that you can own possessions, but the possessions can't own you. It's everything that you have in your life is now subordinate to the will and purposes of Jesus Christ. You are but a steward of everything that he's given you. You own stuff, but stuff doesn't own you. Christ owns you. So the question is, does your Christianity look like this? Does the profession of the faith that you hold to right now, sitting in this chair, does it conform to these standards? Because if it doesn't, what does he say three times? You're not a disciple. You're not a Christian. But if you have, remember what Abraham preached last week. If you have come all the way to Jesus Christ in absolute commitment and loyalty, and you are currently bearing your cross in a crucified life and actively pursuing Jesus Christ, you have rest. You're a disciple. Now, I want to close with something here. I want want to close with an example. Turn with me just for a second to Luke 9. Just a couple pages back here. I, I want to show you an example of what Jesus Christ is talking about in this passage. This is where we're going to close here. So there's two men that approach Jesus on the street here as they're walking. It says, and they were going along the road, Luke 9, 57, Luke 9, 57. It says, they were going along the road and someone said to him, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. By implication, he's saying, I will come to you just as you require. I will bear my cross and come after you just as you require. Verse 58, Jesus says to him, okay, count the cost. 
Here's the cost. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Count the cost because I have nothing. If you want to follow me, count the cost. I have nothing. You're going to have nothing. Only me. That's all you have in this endeavor is Christ. You have nothing else. Verse 59. And he said to another, the other second person, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said to him, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to go say goodbye to those at my home. Stop there. So on its face, these two men seem to be checking every box, right? By all metrics here, they're saying all the right things. They subscribe to all the right things. They believe all the right things. Because in verse 57, the first one says, I'll follow you wherever you go. I've counted the cost. I will follow you everywhere. As a matter of fact, the the second man in verse 61 says the same thing. I will follow you. They even profess him as Lord. Look at verse 59. The first man says, Lord, permit me. The second person in verse 61 says, I will follow you, Lord. They're confessing him, curios in the Greek. I profess you as Lord, and I will follow you wherever you go. Now, all of us would probably celebrate that, as you should. This is, this is a great thing. He's checking all the boxes, saying all the right things. So what's Jesus' response? Look at verse 62. But Jesus said to him, no one, universal, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Why? He said all the right things. They both did. They even profess him as Lord. Why are they not fit for the kingdom? Look at verse 59. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first. Permit me first to go and bury my father. Look at verse 61. And the other said, I will follow you, Lord. But what? First, permit me to go say goodbye to those at my house. Why are they not fit for the kingdom? Because they were willing to follow Jesus Christ. They were willing to profess him as Lord. But they put Christ second in their life. They had other things that they had to do first. Where did their commitments lie? And to the things that they needed to get done first. They put Christ as second in their life. And what does Christ require to come to him? unparalleled, absolute commitment and loyalty to him and to him alone. These guys said everything right. They just put Christ second in their life. So again, I would ask, this is how your Christianity looks. Because if this is how your Christianity looks, you have rest. If you are bearing your cross and you are actively pursuing Jesus Christ, you have rest. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the profundity of your word, for the richness of your word, for the conviction of your word. We know, Lord, that it is your word that sanctifies. It is your word that is truth. It is the truth. And Lord, thank you so much for searching our hearts today with this difficult word, but it's only difficult for those who haven't come all the way. And for those who have come all the way, this is a a source of comfort, a source of relief, a source of assurance and stability in our faith. As Christ is the one that begins our faith, he sanctifies our faith, and he finishes our faith. Lord, for anybody here today that has not come all the way, search their heart, convict their heart, humble their heart, and lead them to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, a faith that is totally committed, a faith that is absolutely and unparalleled, committed and devoted and loyal to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ alone. It's in his name we pray and we give thanks. Amen.